The game. It's what got me here. Every year I fought the good fight and have failed every time. Even the glorious Excalibur that had the power to take out all of my enemies couldn't bring me the sweet taste of victory. But not this year. My time is now! Losing is no longer an option. The sleepless nights training the countless hours researching, the determination to build this mustache, all leads to this year's game. Haha, <laughs> you're up. Sorry, fella. There's a new rule! And we're on. Yeah, give it up for Ben. Sensible advice. Okay, good morning, Grace Christian University. I have your announcements for today. So as you saw, the game starts next week. Who's excited for it? It's always a blast. In the audience right now, we have last year's champion, Talon Palmatier, over to your right. The one to beat. So sign up begins today in the Jack and at Kahawa. In the Jack, it's on the commuter board. So make sure you check that out on your way to class. Sign up. We're going to have all the extensive rules sent to you on Sunday. So be on the lookout. It's super exciting. Game starts at Monday at noon. You'll get your first target in your email. OK, small groups are tonight. Who's excited for that? So as you see up there, those are the small groups and where they meet. If you're in those res halls or those town hall, uh, yeah, yeah, res halls, uh, you will meet with your RA for that. Okay, uh, tomorrow's camp is service day. That means there are no classes, and it's our way of beautifying this campus. So meet at 9 o'clock in the commons. You'll get a chapel scan. You'll get lunch provided, and it goes till noon. Pumpkin Spice and Everything Nice is being run by Blue Stage. That's this Thursday at 8 o'clock right here in Baker Chapel. There's going to be fall activities, cookie decorating, and more, so you won't want to miss that. Eye of the Tiger is this Friday night through Saturday. It is an all-nighter for junior highs, and we love our students to help volunteer. So if you'd like to volunteer, you could speak with Pastor Rick, Bud Moore. There's an info meeting Wednesday at 8 o'clock p.m. in the President's Room. There's lots of athletic events this week. Who loves our sports here at Grays? Yeah. Oh yeah, lots of teams to whack this week, right? Okay, so uh, tonight our volleyball team plays at Kuiper at seven o'clock. So for all of you who don't know, Kuiper used to be like our biggest rival until a few years ago when their sports program canceled. So now it's back. And who's to say we're not rivals yet again? So bring it back. So uh, tonight at 7 o'clock at Kuiper, uh, great students get in free by showing your ID. It's only 20 minutes away, so go out and support. Men's soccer plays at home tomorrow here against our other rival, Great Lakes. That would be at 3 o'clock. 
On Friday at 4.30, we also play home against Maranatha. And this Saturday at 10 o'clock, our softball team, woo, our, so <laughs> our softball team plays at Kellogg Woods, which is 12 minutes away. That's gonna be at 10 o'clock. And then finally, there is our baseball team playing at LMCU Ballpark, which is the home of the West Michigan Whitecaps. That's gonna be a double header uh, starting at one o'clock. It'll be $10 against Rochester University. So you won't wanna miss it. Okay, those are my announcements. Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful Tuesday morning. We're going to have, if you can stand if you're able, we're going to sing a song called Dancing on the Waves. Um, before we sing, though, um, this song is just, I want you just to have us sing it over you. So if you want to sing, feel free to. Um, this is an open invitation to do as you will with it. Just a reminder of just God's faithfulness and his love for us, that even in the midst of every single storm, it's a reminder of the truth and the absolute truth that God gives us and that there's not a storm that's big enough to waver us if our foundation is in him. So.
Amen.
name of Jesus this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the reminder of who you are, all powerful, all glorious, the one who is more than able. But God, you're also the God who sees us in our misery, in our brokenness, and you have an answer, and that answer is just who you are. So I ask you, Lord, that you would remind us to trust you and remind us that we can lean on you and that you're all we've ever needed and you're all that we'll ever need. And so we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. What a great time of worship today. How exciting. Light the fire that will burn. Today, if you're singing and you're listening to those songs of worship and it uh, doesn't light a fire in you, it's like the wood is wet, huh? The wood is wet. It should at least start to smolder a little bit. I'm excited for chapel today. We have a special guest speaker. And we're talking about the fire of God and we're bringing a firefighter. How about that? Is that, uh, is that there? So, uh, Chief... Cochran was with us last night for our annual gala, and we asked him, would you stay and speak to students? To which he went, I love students. And it's like, you better love students. We love our students at Grace Christian University. So we're pro so proud to have him here today to speak and for you to hear the story of our mission of graduating courageous ambassadors for Christ as he exemplifies that in his life of where God began his journey with him and brought him to where he was elevated to the highest position in firefighting in the United States of America. And now he speaks from that humble position of how God has taken him. And he's an example that God uses people committed to him. And so I am so proud to have my brother here today. Brother, come on up. Let's give him a Grace Christian welcome. God bless you. Let me pray for you. Abba Father, bless this man. Use his words. Ignite a fire in us, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. This is a beautiful campus, and this is a beautiful day that the Lord has made. Uh, I so enjoyed the worship that we just shared together, and uh, I feel the presence of God in this chapel today. Anybody besides me feel the presence of God here today? What a wonderful experience. What a wonderful way to start the day. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to Dr. Kemper for the invitation and extend greetings to the student body and the staff of Grace Christian University who are here for this assembly this morning. And I want to talk to you about a challenging topic, but prayerfully that it will inspire your precious souls as students at Grace Christian University. The topic I want to speak on this morning is the blessings of sufferings. The blessings of sufferings. It seems almost odd to put those two words in the same sentence, blessings and sufferings, but that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the blessings of sufferings. My story, I'll share it with you, but the foundation of the story that I want to share uh, is rooted in a scripture that I love. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4. Verses 12 through 14. And when I'm sharing this story, I love the King James version of it. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. I'm a very patriotic Christian American. I love our country. And don't for one moment allow the things that you hear in the media or the things that's going on in our country subtract 
from the simple fact that God predestined United States of America to be the land of the free and the home of the brave, where people from all over the world, from different backgrounds and ethnicities and walks of life, can come to this country and find faith on their own choosing that will ultimately and hopefully lead them to saving grace of Jesus Christ as their Lord. The America is still the greatest country in the entire world. That's a good place to say amen. amen. And one of the things that has been instilled in me from a little boy in elementary school and public school in the South, we used to start our day off singing a patriotic American song and then saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Every single day we were raised that way in school. In the seventh grade, we had to learn the preamble of the United States of America, and every one of us had to learn it and pass it, and we had to be prepared to recite it at a moment's notice. That was instilled in me as a little boy growing up in our country. But one of my most favorite patriotic songs of our nation was written in my lifetime. You may be familiar with it. The lyrics are, if tomorrow I lost all the things I'd worked for all my life and I had to start again with my children and my wife, I thank my lucky stars to still be living here today because the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away. Well, as a firefighter, I've lived a very public life. It goes with the territory. But my public life and public safety became even more publicized the week of Thanksgiving 2014 when it was announced publicly and all over the country that I would be laid off for 30-day suspension without pay. Upon return from the 30-day suspension without pay, my 34-year childhood dream come true fairy tale career came to an abrupt halt when I was terminated from employment as the fire chief of the city of Atlanta, Georgia, Fire and Rescue Department at the hands of then the Honorable Mayor Kasim Reed. The adverse action that I experienced came as a result of a book that I had written in my own personal time for a Christian me and Bible study. And the title of the book is Who Told You That You Were Naked? In the South, we say naked, not naked. Who told you that you were naked? Of course, that's the question that God asked Adam in the Garden of Eden. I was sharing my story about five years ago at Liberty University at their chapel. And when I reached the introduction part where I told them the title of my book, Who Told You That You Were Naked? Can you believe 12,000 college students erupted in laughter? <laughs> and it dawned on me that everyone is not connecting that question to Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, the, God, the question that God asked Adam in the Garden of Eden. However, my little sisters and brothers here at Grace Christian University, the week that followed my termination, I realized that God had been preparing me for that fiery trial my entire life. And it dawned on me, and I came to the staunch conclusion that the Christian walk of faith, our walk of faith, is comprised of a series of level plains, mountain climbs, and valleys. And even in your young, tender years, you've experienced level plains, mountain climbs, and valleys. And guess what? Your future involves level plains, mountain climbs, and valleys. And sufferings are an inherent and even necessary component of fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. In our country today, there's an ever-increasing attack and threat to freedom of religion and freedom of speech in the United States of America. And you're being educated and equipped to be courageous ambassadors to fight and hold the line so that freedom and truth and speech can prevail in our beloved country. My story is but one of a growing list of many where a government entity and special interest groups have worked together to impose adverse action on another American for publicly stating a position based upon biblical truths that is not consistent with popular culture and the shifting pluralism's ever-changing rules and precepts of popular culture and political correctness. And because of that, there's a significant need for all of us in the body of Christ to rise to unprecedented levels of unity and courage so that we can continue 
to hold the line and fight for freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the sanctity of life, biblical marriage as God intended, biblical family as God intended, and for the right for parents to train up their children in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Your generation is going to be birthing children into our country that are going to have to face these challenges if you don't leave here with courageous courage as ambassadors and be willing to lay it all on the line for the truth of the Holy Scriptures. By the grace of God, we have been allowed to live out our faith here in the United States of America. And because our nation was founded in large degree on biblical principles, codified in the Constitution, America has become a great nation because of religious liberty. America, over the years, though we've had our challenges, have flourished because of religious liberty. And the American dream has become a possible, possible and achievable for all Americans because of religious liberty. However, now that we've become so bountifully blessed, and the government protection for the public expression of our faith has become unreliable and fragile. Too many sons and daughters of God are afraid to speak the truth publicly for fear of the consequences that comes from not conforming to the precepts of popular culture and for fear of cancel culture. To put it another way, the redeemed of the Lord are afraid to say so. When I was serving as fire chief in my hometown, Shreveport, Louisiana, in the early 2000s, I began to experience a series of personal and professional challenges. And so I sought God for answers, and God led me to do a word study on the word sufferings at that time. And when I searched the scriptures, I discovered that when we see words in the Bible, like afflictions, trials, tribulations, tests, trouble, temptations, transgressions, persecutions, infirmities, and chastisement, they all fall under the primary heading of sufferings. They are all types of sufferings. And so I wanted to dig a little deeper and look at the lives of men and women in the Bible, and there are many who had experienced sufferings. And guess what? Two categories emerged. On the one hand, there are self-inflicted sufferings, on the other hand, there are God-allowed sufferings. And they are really self-explanatory, aren't they? Self-inflicted sufferings are the afflictions, trials, tribulations, tests, troubles, temptations, transgressions, persecutions, infirmities, and chastisement we bring upon ourselves through disobedience. But God-allowed sufferings are the same things, afflictions, trials, tribulations, tests, troubles, temptations, transgressions, persecution, and infirmities, chastisement, that doesn't have anything to do with what we've done. Strangely and oddly enough, God in his sovereignty allows us to go through sufferings for his own purposes and for his own reasons. It's because of sufferings, my little sisters and brothers here at Grace Christian University, that we become mature believers. I am the mature believer, the disciple of Christ I am today because of the sufferings that I have experienced throughout my life. I can remember times in my terrible 20s, and I pray you don't ever have a testimony about having terrible 20s, but I went through my 20s, I was terrible in my 20s. And I can remember times when I was in my terrible 20s in the throes of my terrible 20s when God would say to me, that's the last time I'm going to let you get away with that. Have you ever heard that voice from God that says, that's the last time I'm going to let you get away with that? Don't raise your hands in here. I don't want anybody else to know. Sufferings over the years have a way of stripping off and pruning off promiscuous ways, bad habits, and bad relationships that will keep us from achieving our destiny. And God knows I've had my share of sufferings, but if I can be transparent with you, out of the category self-inflicted suffering and God allows sufferings, most of the sufferings I've experienced in my life fall, guess what, in the self-inflicted suffering category. Am I the only one? Thank you. I don't feel alone right now. Thank you for sharing your side of the story. But because of Jesus Christ, 
we experience that blessed promise that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. So when I was terminated in 2015 from my childhood dream fairy tale career, the thing that came to my mind immediately because of my track record of self-inflicted sufferings was that God was punishing me again for something that I have done. And God quickly reminded me of what he taught me in the early 2000s. Can I pause there for station identification? Listen, most of the time when we're going through sufferings, our first inclination is draw the conclusion that God is punishing me for something that I have done. But you've got to remember that there's another type of suffering. There's another side of sufferings that has nothing to do with what you have done. And that's the God allows sufferings. And so God says, this has nothing to do with you. In spite of your terrible 20s, this has nothing to do with you. This has everything to do with me. But can I tell you something else to shout about? That when you're a child of God, and I know that because the Holy Spirit is in this room, when I talk about self-inflicted sufferings and God allows sufferings, most of us actually do a a recording and a flashback over the self-inflicted sufferings we brought upon ourselves, and we struggle to find God-allowed sufferings, and we start to feel a guilt and a shame and a condemnation because of our track record of self-inflicted sufferings. But the good news is, it doesn't matter what type of suffering you're going through, all of our sufferings are under the sovereign supervision and watch of God, and he's going to work them all out together for our good. He has a way of turning our mess into a message and turning our tests and tribulations into a testimony. And so God says, this has nothing to do with you. This is all on me. And I became a lot freer because of what I was going through. Because when we realize that God has taken us through God allows sufferings, he carries the weight of it and we don't have to carry the weight. It's what Jesus meant when he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. One of the greatest things that causes believers to cower in our culture is the fear of losses. And God says, I got you, I got your family, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And then he reminded me, I'm in pretty good company with God allowed sufferings. He reminded me that Job is the poster child of how God moves in the lives of his people who experience God allowed suffering. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are great examples of how God moves in the lives of his people who lay it all on the line and experience God allowed suffering. Their colleague, Daniel, is a good example of how God moves in the lives of his sons and daughters who experience God allows suffering. Joseph is a good example. Esther is a good example. Mordecai is a good example. Jesus is the best example of what God does in the lives of his people who experience God allows suffering. So if you're going through God allows sufferings, as a believer, we should rejoice on the front end. Be happy and exceedingly joyful for sharing in Christ's sufferings. And so there's five quick lessons I want to share with you. I know you got class today and you've had a lot of lessons already at the beginning of the school year, but I've got five quick lessons I want to share with you. I'll spend the most time on lesson number one, so I'll I'll tell you about it and move on to lesson number two. The first thing that we need to recognize when we're actually going through sufferings is, number one, God always prepares his sons and daughters for sufferings. He always prepares us. Number two is the toughest of the five lessons. There are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. There are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. I love giving three examples from believers in other countries. Remember about seven years ago, 21 Christian Egyptians were captured by the radical group of Islamists called ISIS, and they were given an ultimatum to reject Jesus Christ or die. They were going to cut off their heads if they didn't reject Jesus Christ. Not a single one of those Christian Egyptian men rejected Jesus Christ, and they were beheaded because there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. In Afghanistan at that time, 
in villages where Christian families were known to live, the Taliban would search those neighborhoods. When they find a Christian family, they'd mark an N on the door because they referred to Jesus as the Nazarene. A day or so later, they would come back, pull the family in a room, and they would talk directly to the fathers, to the husbands, and they would tell the dads, your children are going to die today. The only way they get to live is for you to reject Jesus Christ, reject the Nazarene. There's not a single case on record where one of those fathers, Christian fathers in Afghanistan, rejected Jesus Christ. So guess what happened? Their precious children were killed right in front of them. About a year after all of that was taking place in northern Kenya at a college campus where Christian and Muslim students attended, a radical group of Islamists stormed the college campus, separated the Muslim students from the Christian students, and told all the Christian students, about 125, and if I'm looking in here, it's about that many in here today. They told all the Christian students, you are all going to die today. The only way you get to live is to reject Jesus Christ. 125 college students refused to reject Jesus Christ. And they were all gunned down on the spot because there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. In the United States of America, we are not close to experiencing those kinds of consequences. Unless as the body of Christ, we remain divided, passive, and silent in this cultural moment, and unless our colleges and universities are educating and raising up courageous ambassadors who will lead their institutions and go out to secular institutions and jobs and areas of employment and take a stand for biblical truth. If that does not happen, then one day in our country we could face similar consequences but Dr. Kemper and I will be long gone when that happens, and it'll be your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren who will be facing those consequences. Number two, there are worldly consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ. Number three, there are kingdom consequences for standing on biblical truth and standing for Christ, and the kingdom consequences are always greater than the worldly consequences. They are always greater. The challenge in our country is we have too many sons and daughters of God who have more fear in the worldly consequences, lesson number two, than they have faith in the kingdom consequences that God has promised Lesson number three, Jesus said, whatever you lose standing for me, I will restore it 100 fold in this life, which means before you die, whatever you lose standing for me, I'll restore it 100 fold. And he gave examples. If you lose your house, if you lose your wife, if you lose your children, if you lose your land, in our context, that if, if you lose your job, if you lose your elected office, if you lose your church, if you lose your boyfriend, if you lose your girlfriend, if you get kicked out of a fraternity or a sorority, if you become unfriended, what Jesus said, whatever you lose, I'm going to replace it with something a hundred times greater than what you lost. It's amazing that some of us as sons and daughters of God are holding on to possessions that we fear losing and we're rejected a hundred times better than what we're hanging on to. Now, if that spoke to you in a dating relationship, today is a good day to break up with that rascal <laughs> so that you can get your hundredfold man, your hundredfold woman. <laughs> And you can tell them Chief Cochran told me to do it. <laughs> Lesson number four, sufferings are always for the greater glory of God. It's always going to bring God glory when we endure sufferings. Our enemies will get to see a side of God that they would never see unless we take a stand. And then we get to see a side of God that we would have never seen unless we take a stand. And then the fifth lesson is God always rewards his sons and daughters who have the courage and grace to stand. He always does. He's never failed to do that. Job was restored one, uh, twice as much as he lost. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were appointed to governors in provinces of Babylon. 
Mordecai became the prime minister of the Medes and Persians and put in a policy to overturn the policies that Haman had put into place. Esther inherited the whole estate of Haman, and he was one of the richest guys in Medes and Persia. Esther, uh, 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 Daniel, uh, actually became uh, at a higher level because the guys who tried to plot against him to keep him from being promoted, they were actually killed. David became the king of both Judah and Israel because of the sufferings that he endured. And Jesus now has the name above every name because of the sufferings that he endured. God never fails to take the lives of his sons and daughters who endure to a whole nother level that's exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. I got six minutes to cover lesson number one. How did God prepare me for what I'm going through for what I've gone through. He prepared me through my childhood upbringing. He prepared me through my career development, and he prepared me through my family. I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana in 1960 at Confederate Memorial Hospital. That's a testimony within itself in the South. My mom and dad were very poor. My dad left my mother for another woman. He was an alcoholic. He fathered two other children. I had three big brothers above me and two little sisters came after me. When dad left, we couldn't afford to live in the government projects anymore. So my mom moved us a few blocks over in a back alley called Rear Snow Street. And we were living in a house called a shotgun house, a front room, a middle room, and a back room, a front door and a back door that if you open the front door and the back door and shot a gun through it, it'll go right out of the back door without touching anything. Shotgun houses were the raggediest, most stank houses in the South. Me and my four brothers, we slept in one bed, stacked on cinder blocks, a box spring and mattress stacked on cinder blocks. My two little sisters slept in the same room, a raggedy box spring and mattress stacked on cinder blocks with boards across the top of them. We were on welfare and food stamps. We never had enough food to make it to the end of the month. My mother only had enough money to buy bread and mayonnaise and burr rabbit syrup. And so when we had breakfast, it was toast with burr rabbit syrup. When we had lunch, it was mayonnaise sandwiches with sugar water. When we had dinner, it was mayonnaise sandwiches with sugar water until the next welfare checks and food stamps came. We were very poor. But in that alley, we joined the Galilee Baptist Church at the top of the alley. We started going to the church, and I began to see things from a five-year-old perspective that changed my life. I saw men there with their wives and had children around me and my little sister's age, and they were nicer dressed than we were. They, their clothes were better than our clothes, and they were happier than our family was. And I realized that was God's design for a family, and I wanted a family like that when I grew up. Also, I realized that it was uh, not God's design for his children to be suffering in poverty. So I had a dream that I would not be poor when I grew up because those families just didn't look like they were on welfare and food stamps and eating man-edged sandwiches and drinking sugar water. And then one Sunday after church, there was a fire across the street. Miss Maddie's house caught on fire. The firefighters came. And when I was standing on the front porch of that shotgun house watching that firefighters that day, at five years old, I looked at my mom and my brothers and sisters and I said, I want to be a fireman when I grow up. And they taught us all your dreams are going to come true if you believe in and have faith in God, if you go to school and get a good education, if you respect grown-ups and treat other children like you want to be treated, they said all your dreams are going to come true. And I believe that they were telling me the truth. And so in 1981, my dream came true. The first part of that story is to share with you that God prepared me for the day that I was terminated by the sufferings he delivered us from when I was growing up as a child. When I became a firefighter, my dream came true, but it was challenging because I was one of the first African-Americans, and it was very difficult. The things that were done to us it would break your heart. But the favor of God was on my career and my life, and I continued to apply those principles, believe in and have faith in God, get a good education, educate yourself on the job, respect the authority of the Shreveport Fire Department, and treat the other firefighters like you want to be treated no matter how they are treating you. And so God blessed me. I promoted in four years. I was a captain. In 12 years, I was an assistant chief. In 18 years, I became the fire chief of the Shreveport Fire Department, which is the youngest ever and the first African American ever. Eight years later, I was appointed to the fire chief in the city of Atlanta under Mayor Shirley Franklin. 
Two years after that, President Obama gets elected and appoints me to be the head of the United States Fire Administration in the Department of Homeland Security. Now, here's this same little boy going up at an at-risk family in a back alley in Shreveport, Louisiana, on welfare stamps and food stamps, welfare and food stamps, had a childhood dream to become a firefighter, now the highest fire official in the United States of America. No God but our God, no country but our country. I'm out of time, but I got to tell you this, God prepared us through our, through our family. When I was a firefighter, I was a wild bachelor. I became all of a sudden popular with girls, and so I was dating like crazy for about six months, and God told me I had to find a wife, and I knew I had heard from God, and so my plan was, rather than search for somebody I'd never met, think about the girls I admired all my life, and then if God pointed one out to me, my sign was going to be, if your heart started beating and singing, that's the one God wants you to marry. So I started from college and went all the way back thinking about the girls. When I reached elementary school in the fourth grade, a girl that I loved named Carolyn Marshall, I thought about her and my heart started beating and singing. So my problem was, how am I going to find Carolyn Marshall after all these years? And we didn't have Facebook back at that time. We didn't have ChristianMingle.com at that time. <laughs> And so we had a phone book. Y'all probably need to know what a phone, tell them what a phone book is later. We'll tell them. That. And so I went to the Marshall section in the phone book, and I started at the top of the list. I called the number, and I said, my name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm trying to find a girlfriend I had in the fourth grade. Her name is Carolyn Marshall. Does she live here? They said, no. I said, well, do you know anybody by that name? They said, no. And I hung up the phone, went to the next number, and called the number. The person answered the phone. I said, my name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm trying to find a girlfriend I had in fourth grade. Her name is Carolyn Marshall. Does she live here? No. Do you know anybody by that name? No. I went through the whole list. Nobody said she lived there. Nobody said they knew a Carolyn Marshall. Some of those folks were not telling me the truth, but I was not discouraged. When I'd get off from the fire station, I'd drive through Allendale, where we grow up, hoping that one day I'd see her walking down the sidewalk or sitting on the front porch of a shotgun house drinking a cold glass of sugar water. Or maybe one day I'd run into somebody we grew up with and say, hey, you remember me? Yeah, Kevin, I remember you. I'm looking for Carolyn. Do you know where she lives? And I, my prayer was that they'd say, man, yes, yeah, she lived right around the corner. That never happened. So I was miserable after about two months of that. I was going back home. God said, check the phone book again. So I was looking in the phone book and I saw why I had skipped one of the numbers. So I didn't think about it long. I called the number, but my enthusiasm was completely gone. So when the person answered the phone, I said, my name is Kelvin Cochran. I'm trying to find the girlfriend I had in the fourth grade. Her name is Carolyn Marshall. Does she live here? And the voice said, this is she. And man, I broke into my happy dance at that. <laughs> Flossing wasn't out back then. And I said, Carolyn, this is Kelvin. Do you remember me? She said, yeah, Kelvin, I remember you. I said, Carolyn, I'm a firefighter now. I have a good job with good benefits. I've been dating like crazy for the last six months. God woke me up one morning and said, I need to find a wife, and you are the chosen one. <laughs> she said, you must be crazy. I said, no, I'm not crazy. Can I come over and talk to you about it? She said, no, you can't come over here. I have a boyfriend, and he's on the way over now. I said, Carolyn, God said you're going to be my wife. God said, we're going to have a wonderful life. We'll have a nice home. We'll have beautiful children. You'll never want for anything. And I was barely making above minimum wage. <laughs> but her boyfriend at the time must have never whispered those sweet nothings in her ear because the next thing she said was, he'll be at work tomorrow night. And so I said, can I come over tomorrow night? She said, yeah, you can come over. She was still living with her mama in the government projects. I went over. It was a cold January night. She made me a cup of hot chocolate, came back to the kitchen table with the hot chocolate. I knelt down on one knee, and I said, Carolyn, would you marry me? And you would not believe what she said. Mama, you got to come in here. Her mother came in. She said, Mom, this is Kelvin. I hadn't seen this boy in years. I talked to him last night. I let him come over tonight, and he just asked me to marry him. And so I explained to her mom I was not crazy, asked for her daughter's hand in marriage. Six months later, we got married, and last June, we celebrated 41 years of holy matrimony. But here's the lesson. When you skip dating and courtship, and you start a relationship with an engagement, and you get married in six months, you can have a lot of sufferings along the way. 
But when your marriage is rooted and grounded in Christ, he'll use those sufferings to strengthen your whole day for the day that the head of the household gets fired from his childhood dream come true fairy tale career. And all I'm trying to tell you, sisters and brothers here at Grace Christian University, there is blessings and suffering. Take it on, head on. Our back is not against the wall. We are not at the end of our rope. Throwing in the towel is not an option. We have decided to follow Jesus. We have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I went over. I apologize. No, no.